Hello everyone. Let's complete the unfinished business about the strabismus revision. This is the third video. Let's talk right now about ease of deviation. Near ease deviation is extremely important uh, because it is the most common type of uh, childhood strabismus, accounting for more than 50% of the total uh, pediatric population or pediatric strabismus population. Uh, for the epidemiology, it is more common in Africans and in whites than uh, in the Asian groups. So here, Africans is high and white uh, rate is high, okay? Um, let's talk here about the risk factors here. This is not that important. Uh, this slide is not that important, but here hypropia is, um, uh, uh, let's focus on this because here hypropia will uh, be uh, uh, related to more accommodation and more convergence. So this is related to the accommodative type of uh, isotropy, and this will be mentioned again. Uh, also the prematurity or the low birth weight, also the maternal smoking during pregnancy and the positive family history, they are all risk factors for development of um, uh, deviation. Amblyopia um, develops in approximately 50% of children uh, who have isotropia. This is extremely important again, because this is important in treatment. You should treat the strabismus and also you should treat amblyopia as we mentioned before. Uh, here, uh, what about the clinical types of isodivision? I may have pseudo uh, or false strabismus, and they may have true strabismus. So here, this one is false, which is called pseudo isodeviation. It is caused by three uh, causes. Number one, I may have a very short interpupillary distance. So both eyes are close to each other. This will give an impression, a false impression of having strabismus, but actually the optical axis is uh, in line with or parallel to the, the other optical axis of the other eye. Okay, uh, this is for short interpupillary distance. Also, here um, you know, the eyes are um, aligned, but you, you may have the skin fold like that. This is called the picanthus, which will give uh, also a false impression of having strabismus or uh, uh, pseudo isodeviation. Okay. Uh, after that, you may have uh, negative angle kappa. What do you mean by angle kappa? Angle kappa it is the angle between the pupillary line, which is a line in the middle of the cornea, in the middle, the middle of the pupil, like that, and uh, also the visual axis, which is related to the fovea, like that. Normally, the angle kappa is um, about five degrees to the nasal side. So here, the intersection in the cornea, like that, and make it more accurate here. Okay, like that. The intersection, the cornea is towards the nasal side like that. This is the normal appearance. But in cases of elongation of the eye, for example, in cases of uh, high myopia, you may find this uh, macula here present in, in this part. So you may find this, um, uh, this line in the temporal part. This is called negative angle kappa. So if, you, if, if the intersection is in the temporal part, this is called negative angle kappa. And in cases of negative angle kappa, you may have here the pupil light reflex in the temporal part like that. This, this uh, uh, light reflex in the temporal part like that. Okay, this will give you uh, a false impression of having isodeviation. So this is called pseudo isodeviation. So I have three causes for pseudo isodeviation. I have negative angle kappa. Also, I have short interpupillary distance and also epicanthus. Let's talk about the most important one. I actually I have two important ones. I have infantile isotropy and I have accommodative. They are the most important ones. Okay. Uh, Number one, which is infantile isotropy. Here in this slide, I, I do care about two issues. The definition of congenital or infantile, it is, uh, it is present or apparent before the age of six months. This is extremely important, okay? And this is the definition of congenital or infantile. And also the second important uh, part in, in this uh, slide, which is ocular instability. You should differentiate between the, the isotropia, which is true strabismus, and ocular instability of infancy, because this child has no phobia. So this child has no fixation, so his eyes will move outward or, or inward. So this is called ocular instability, so you should differentiate between them. Actually, after the age of two months, you can differentiate between them. Why? Because here, if you if you uh, if the angle is constant and if the angle is more than uh, 30 present diopters, this uh, is uh, um, likely to uh, give the diagnosis of infantile isotropy. What are the theories of infantile isotropy? I have two theories. I have sensory one, which is um, made by Worth, 
fourth sensory, he assumed that the problem is in the brain, in the uh, visual cortex. So here in the visual cortex, I don't have fusion. So um, there is deficiency in the binocularity cells or in the fusion uh, centers. Uh, so the problem here is central, it is in the fusion. And th this is not uh, that evident because when we do muscle surgery, uh, when we do alignment by muscle surgery, the fusion will be good. So this is about the sensory and this is not that proven. But uh, the Chavez theory, which is motor one, which is uh, which aligned the problem as having just uh, just uh, ocular misalignment or uh, muscular misalignment. So the motor theory, which is the Chavez is more uh, applicable because when we do uh, the, um, when we do the strabismus surgery, the fusion or the functions will be good. The clinical features here, this is extremely important. The onset as we, by definition here, this is the definition of congenital within the first six months. It is idiopathic, okay? Here I have large stable angle over 30 prism diopter, and this is to differentiate between this and the ocular instability. Ocular instability, you don't have constant angle, but here the angle is stable, the angle is large. Also, the angle is large, which is over 30 to differentiate between this and accommodative. The accommodative one is not that large, it is moderate angle. Uh, also, I have here alternating fixation or alternating strabismus. Some, sometimes you, you find that the right eye is uh, deviating, sometimes you find that the left eye is deviating and so on. Cross fixation, especially in large angles, you, you cross fixation mean that the right eye will see the left field and the left eye will see the right field. Look at this one here, the, the angle is very large. So this will see um, this part of field and this will see this part of field. This is called cross fixation. Manifest latent nystagmus, what about this? Here I do have nystagmus, which is uh, uh, which is not evident or which is latent by uh, the binoc binocularity. So the binocularity will disrupt this nystagmus. If you uh, cover one eye, so here you will disrupt the binocularity, so that the, the nystagmus will be more evident, and the direction of the nystagmus will be towards the fixating eye. So the first phase is towards the fixating eye. This is the fixating or uncovered eye. So the direction of the first phase will be towards this eye towards this side, for example, towards right here, okay? Um, uh, what, what do you mean by ma manifest latent? Here it is manifest, it may be manifest, but with uh, low frequency and low amplitude. Um, uh, and latent, because if you cover one eye, this will be more manifest, this will be more aggressive. Okay, uh, normal refraction, actually this manifest latent nystagmus may be the etiology of the DVD, which, which will be mentioned right now. Uh, normal refraction for age, which is plus one or plus two hypropia, it is typical for uh, uh, these cases, because if you have more than plus two uh, uh, hypropia, this hypropia may be the underlying cause for developing of strabismus, because the hypropia, as we mentioned, will require accommodation in order to, uh, in order to focus rays on, on the retina here. We do have accommodation. This accommodation will be accompanied by convergence. So uh, here uh, we do have the normal refraction for age. Uh, inferior oblique over action, which is which is evident uh, almost by one year or even after, uh, this is a common association between the infantile strabismus. Uh, there is association between infantile strabismus and inferior oblique overaction. Also, the DVD dissociated uh, strabismus complex, or more specifically, dissociated vertical deviation, occurs by uh, um, occurs in eighty percent of cases by the age of three years. Also, here uh, amblyopia, uh, which will which will occur in, in just fifty percent, or in, in almost half of uh, uh, patients with isodeviation, and this is mentioned. This was mentioned before. Uh, look at this one. This is extremely important. And actually, there was a question in, I think, in advanced ICO exam before about this one, which is uh, the asymmetry in the smooth pursue. Here, uh, uh, if you see the smooth pursuit or pursue movement, when we uh, move the eye from uh, temporal to nasal and from nasal to temporal, from nasal to temporal, you'll find that the movement is slow. This is uh, normal in the first six months, but after this, if it is persistent, this will be indicative of infantile isotropia. So in cases of infantile isotropia, you find what? I'll find that I have uh, persistent uh, smooth pursue asymmetry. 
Uh, the question in the, IT, in the ICO, I remember it, it is asymmetry when you uh, move the drum, optokinetic nystagmus drum from nasal to temporal. This was the correct one, from nasal to temporal, because here the smooth piercing will, will move uh, towards uh, the, direction of, um, the direction of the optokinetic nystagmus drum. Uh, fusion male development nystagmus syndrome. This is the other name or the correct name for a manifest latent nystagmus. So it is called latent and manifest or manifest latent nystagmus, or it is called fusion male development nystagmus syndrome. As I told you, this nystagmus is manifest but with low amplitude and low frequency. Uh, and after you cover one eye, after you disrupt the bi binuclearity, so it is latent by bin binuclearity. After you disrupt this binuclearity, uh, you will find that the nystagmus will increase in amplitude and increase in frequency. Uh, here, Sciencia syndrome it is some form of um, some severe form of infantile isotropia characterized by three issues. Here, the angle is typically over 50 press diopter. Also, yeah, here it is large angle. Also, you do have cross fixation because the angle is large, and this is logic. If you have large angle, you have cross fixation. I told you this before. Uh, and here I do have here uh, uh, some form of nystagmus. Look at this eye. This is Sanchia eye or Sanchia syndrome. Look at this one. Here you have what? I have a nystagmus abducting nystagmus. So the direction of nystagmus will be towards the abduction with very small uh, amplitude and uh, very high frequency. So the frequency will be high, the amplitude will be low. Okay. Um, Let's talk about the management here. It is extremely important. The first step is to correct for the um, refractive error. So you give cy cycloplegic refraction, especially in uh, cases of hypropic, significant hypropic refractive errors must should be corrected by prescribing the full cycloplegic refraction. This is extremely important. Actually, this won't correct the infantile strabismus. But what is the value of this? If you have another accommodative element, this accommodative element must be treated. Before you uh, talk about before you talk about uh, the surgery, okay, ocular al alignment is rarely achieved without surgery in early onset isotropia. This is uh, extremely evident. If you have infantile isotropia, you should um, you should treat. You should do surgeries. Uh, previously, it was thought that you know, concurrent amblyopia should be fully treated before surgery. This is uh, written. This is written. Actually, this is written in questions of IDOCs, but this is uh, um, a common old belief. Right now we can do the surgery and after the surgery we can treat uh, for the amblyopia. We can treat the amblyopia after the surgery. Here, uh, the, the goal of the treatment is to reduce the deviation to orsotropia. And this will, um, this will, uh, um, this will bring some, uh, some, some degrees of uh, binocular fusion or sensory fusion. Here, this is extremely important. Alignment within uh, eight to uh, ten uh, prism diopters. This is um, this is called monofixation syndrome, or this is called microtropia. So here it is a favorable outcome. By the way, if you do a surgery and you have here this eye is aligned here and this eye has slight isotropia, which is just uh, eight to ten prism diopters. I I mentioned this monofixation syndrome before. But here it is evident here, monofixation syndrome or uh, microtropia. Here the patient will have just central suppression scotoma. And uh, even if the, the patient has uh, central sub suppression scotoma, he, he will retain some uh, binuclearity, he will retain good binuclearity with some degrees of stereopsis. So this is a favorable uh, outcome. Actually, this is favorable because um, uh, it will decrease the recurrence rate in, in cases of uh, in cases of uh, um, uh, alignment. Here, if you if you do have here alignment, you may have after the alignment, you you may have overcorrection. You may have exo deviation. So this will decrease the chances of de development of exo deviation. Okay, uh, bifoveal fusion is not achieved. It is therefore considered a successful surgical uh, result. Even though, although bifoveal uh, fusion is not achieved, it is considered a successful surgical result. So I don't have bifoveal uh, uh, fixation, but the surgery will be considered as a successful surgery. Here, what is the timing? And here, the, it is debatable between the, the American uh, school and the European or 
the um, German, especially the German school. Here, uh, it is preferable in the American school to, to, to be done uh, between the age of six to 24 months. Uh, the delayed school, which is uh, uh, from 32 to 60 months. So it is, uh, it is uh, at uh, almost five months. What the difference between them? Here in this group, uh, the sensory functions will be slightly higher. Okay, so here the binocularity and the stereopsis for uh, this group will be uh, higher. Uh, but here uh, in this group, I'll have less operation um, I'll have less operation times. So here, just one operation may suffice for this group, this older group. Why? Because the, in, in this group, you will have a DVD, the associated vertical deviation will be evident in, in most cases. And also the inferior oblique over action, if it is associated, it will be also evident. So here in this group, you will have uh, the all associations. So you can do just one operation and correct for all the strabismus or all the, the strabismus and it's associated. Okay, uh, here, uh, look at this one. Here, uh, when we do the surgery, uh, we, we guarantee that the sensory functions will be higher. Uh, we start by recession of both medial erectile muscles, but uh, if the angle of deviation is uh, large, this is logic, if the angle is large, you can operate on, on three or even four uh, horizontal rectus muscles. What about Botox? Botox here, it is uh, done to delay the surgery. So you, you, can, uh, you can do uh, Botox, but it is a temporary one. Actually, this is, not, uh, this is not recommended in most of cases because it has higher rate of post-operative abnormal binocularity in, in cases of uh, Botox. Um, what about accommodative isotropia? So the, we, we have finished right now uh, the congenital isotropia. Let's move to accommodative isotropia. At first, we know that accommodation is composed of uh, three issues. It is composed of uh, um, accommodation, which has increased the power of the crystalline lens, and also it is uh, accompanied by convergence, and also it is accompanied by meiosis. So here, these are the components of the knee reflex, which is the accommodation reflex or the knee reflex. So accommodation is accompanied by convergence, and here each one diopter of accommodation will be will have uh, normally from three to five present diopters of conversions. This is the normal value. So if you increase the accommodation, uh, actually, you will increase what you will increase the conversions. So accommodative isotropy is dependent on accommodation. If you increase accommodation, the conversions will be increased leading to accommodative isotropy. Look at this one here. This is the uh, according to the accommodation, the classification of um, the classification of uh, 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 accommodative isotropia, it is either refractive or high ACP ratio. Here in cases of refractive, I have what? I have hypropia or hypermetropia. In cases of hypermetropia, the patient ha has to accommodate in order to get the, the image in the focus here like that, okay? In order to focus the image on the retina, okay? Uh, and this accommodation will be accompanied by excessive conversions. Okay, so uh, excessive accommodation will be accompanied by excessive conversions. This is the refractive one. Also, uh, there is another type which is called the convergence excess. Here, the patient has no refractive error, but when he, he looks at near, when he reads, for example, when he's watching this session, for example, the patient will have what the patient will have uh, more convergence than normal because it, he has high AC per ratio. So uh, there is no refractive error, but actually there is high AC per ratio. I have mixed type, which is both. The patient has refractive error together with uh, abnormal or abnormally high AC per ratio. This is uh, the accommodative uh, type. Actually, I have non-accommodative non-accommodative causes of uh, isotropia or isodeviation, okay, like that of cyclic or basic yeah, and so on, and sensory. So I have the non-accommodative element or non-accommodative uh, non -accommodative type. And I have partial accommodative. Here, this partial accommodative, the patient has either refractive error or high ACP ratio or even both, but this is not all the angle of strabismus. The angle of strabismus is composed of both accommodative element, which can be corrected by glasses and 
non-accommodative element which cannot be treated before or or you know, until we do surgery. So this is the importance of partial accommodative. This is the classification. But let's uh, focus on the characters of um, let's focus on on the char characteristics or the characters of the accommodative. Near the onset is um, uh, is older than that of um, the congenital one be between six months and seven years, averaging. Uh, two and a half years. This is extremely important, but it can be as early as four months. This is not that evident. Usually intermittent at onset, and after that it, become, uh, it becomes constant. It is concomitant because here the angle of strabismus is uh, constant in all positions of gaze. It is often uh, hereditary, okay? It is often hereditary. Sometimes it is precipitated by trauma or illness, frequently associated with amblyopia. And that's why we don't have diplo diplopia. But here we do have diplopia in some cases, especially in older uh, children. So here, if the child is old enough, um, uh, the diplopia may be present. Okay, but it is eliminated. You can eliminate the diplopia by either uh, the suppression or um, uh, or the anomalous retinal correspondence in older children also. Okay, this, this is the refractive. This is, uh, I do have refractive. I do have what? I do have non-refractive, which is uh, a convergence excess one. What about the management here? Uh, the management of refractive accommodative isotropia it is false cycloplegic correction. Here I do have hypermetropia or hypropia. This hypropia is treated by, or is uh, uh, treated by giving the false cycloplegic refraction. Okay, if binocular fusion is maintained after after several months, you can decrease this high pro, this uh, false cycloplegic refraction by one to um, two uh, diopters less, less than the uh, false cycloplegic refraction. Okay, so here uh, the patient will be normal. So um, yeah, we, we can decrease, we can treat uh, the hypermetropia as uh, non strabismus uh, patient. But at first, we should give the cycloplegic refraction. Don't um, don't make it the reverse because uh, it is seen somehow uh, that some 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 doctors prefer to uh, start with uh, um, with decreasing the cycloplegic refraction and then they give the cycloplegic refraction. No, here it is the reverse. In cases of strabismus, you should start with the full cycloplegic refraction. After that, after the fusion occurs by several months you can decrease the cycloplegic refraction by one to two uh, diopters in order to get some sort of uh, the ciliary tone. Okay, amblyopia if present may uh, respond to spectacle correction alone. And this is uh, uh, extremely important. Uh, actually treatment with occlusion or atropine may be necessary if the amblyopia persists after a period of spectacle wear. So here uh, the patient has hypermetropia. If you give this patient uh, the full cycloplegic uh, refraction, this patient may uh, get improved. The amblyopia may get improved. Okay. Actually, this is extremely important in counseling. Here, uh, you should counsel the parents that uh, this isotropia will persist, uh, but it will, it will be dampened by glasses. So the glasses is not the cure. It, it will temporize. Okay. It will temporize. It will control the isotropia or the strabismus, not curing uh, the strabismus. Okay, the other type, which is high AC per air ratio, or it is called uh, convergence excess. This patient has convergence excess. So the problem is in near, uh, the patient may, may uh, need just near glasses in order to avoid accommodation. Okay, so here the patient has high AC per air ratio. If you give the patient uh, near glasses, you won't have to, you, you won't have to have or to develop any accommodation. So here there is there, there won't be convergence as well. So the patient will have uh, bifocals or near glasses, this will suffice. The initial prescription should be with the lowest uh, plus power needed here to achieve ocular alignment at near fixation. Um, Okay, here uh, uh, an acceptable response is fusion at distance and less than 10 prism diopter residual isotropy at near. This will be uh, extremely, uh, extremely uh, acceptable. And here it is preferable. Why, why we do a residual one in order to, uh, in order to uh, signifying the potential for fusion. Here the patient will, will have what 
uh, here the patient will have fusional divergence. So I'll, I'll exercise, I'll give this patient some sort of exercise in order to develop fusional divergence in order to get fusion. So this one is, is extremely important. So you, you should uh, make the patient orthotropic for far and uh, you can you can leave some residual uh, for near. Um, here, uh, the children uh, need to be slowly weaned from bifocal glasses if they, they improve. If these, uh, some children uh, will improve spontaneously with time. Others need to be slowly weaned from bifocal glasses. So you should withdraw this bifocal glasses um, by uh, uh, gradually, not uh, gradually, not uh, abruptly or suddenly. So um, this is important. Here you can do surgery in cases of high AC per A ratio, and this is controversial. Okay, by medial rectus uh, recessions, like any case of isotropia, but this is controversial. And here you, you do have risk which is not high. It is below 10% of having uh, overcorrection at distance because at distance the patient is also tropic. If you correct, this may carry a risk of having a distance overcorrection. This is extremely important. You can use the PRISM adaptation order to, to predict uh, the outcome of uh, um, surgery. And I mentioned this PRISM adaptation before in the uh, uh, last session. Here uh, also for treatment, you may observe as long as distant, distance uh, alignment allows for the development of peripheral fusion. This, uh, this uh, uh, I prefer to, to just observe these cases. Okay, um, also here, uh, if glasses correct all or nearly all the isotropia, and if some degrees of sensory binocular cooperation or fusion is present, the clinician may begin to reduce the hypropic correction to create a small isophoria. This is extremely important. If the patient has some residual or some phoria, this will, uh, this will stimulate, I mentioned this before, this will stimulate the fusional divergence. And this will uh, help these cases, like this exercising prism. I create some sort of isophoria in order to uh, develop or stimulate the fusional divergence. Uh, here also, uh, the fusional divergence, which, which will be exercised or which will be increased, I increase the fusional divergence. And also here, the patient will, um, will uh, develop immetropization. Actually, the, 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 the child will have hypropia, and this hypropia will be, uh, will be improved by time, and the patient will, will uh, the natural decrease of both hypropia and high AC per air issue will, so the high AC per, per air issue will decrease, also the hypropia will be decreased together with increased fusional divergence, so uh, these patients may do without glasses after a while, or after a short time, okay? Uh, partially accommodative isotropia. Here, it is extremely important in counseling. So here, the, the important of par, uh, importance of partially accommodative isotropia is counseling, because here the surgery won't correct for the all angle of strabismus. So here I have surgical factor, and I have here also accommodative factor. So the glasses will correct for some some issue, and the surgery will correct for the other issue. Here, it, it is extremely important to be counseled uh, counseled with the patient. Uh, with the, the parents, okay. After that, I have basic uh, um, or basic acquired non-accommodative isotropia. This is extremely important um, because this is uh, extremely important in differential diagnosis because it is uh, at the age of uh, that of the accommodative isotropia. But it is uh, in the characters, it is like that of the congenital isotropia. So it is like congenital, but it's, it's a start is uh, after the age of six months, so it is not uh, not called infantile or it is not called uh, congenital. It is called basic acquired non-accommodative isotropy. Here, look at this one, careful evaluation. This is the importance to uh, rule out an accommodative or paritic component. This is extremely important. Here, it may be precipitated by, uh, uh, by uh, prolonged disruption of the binocular vision by any cause like amblyopia or mechanical ptosis and so on. Okay. Uh, actually, it, it may be associated with uh, uh, neurological disorder. So uh, neuroimaging and neuro, uh, neurologic evaluation may be indicated in these cases. 
This one is extremely important here, uh, extremely important in questions. Cyclic isotropia, one day good, one day bad. Okay, one day good, one day bad. Uh, it is a cycle of 48 hours. Uh, it is concomitant and intermittent, usually occurring every other day. So one day is good, one day is orthotropic, one day is bad, which is isotropic. Here, occlusion is contraindicated. This is extremely important because occlusion may, con may convert the cyclic deviation into a constant one. So it will be one day bad, one day bad, one day bad, and so on. Uh, I won't have here one day good, okay? Uh, the functions in the orthotropic um, day is extremely good and the, the ambiopia is unlikely because here I do have um, an orthotropic day. Uh, actually, the functions in the other day will be very bad, like stereopsis and so on. Surgical treatment is usually effective, but, but here, here what, what about the surgical treatment? I'll do, uh, based on the maximal angle, I'll do a correction uh, of the maximal angle of deviation present when the eye, uh, eyes are isotropic. So here I always give this example. If uh, the angle of deviation is 30 present after in the uh, isotropic day and it is zero in the um, uh, other day, the, the orthotropic day, um, I should correct for this one, for uh, this full 30 present after. Some, uh, 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 some questions, it is written like 30 or 40 or 15, which is midway between or zero, which is mid midway between 30 and 15, okay? So I'll correct for this one, which is 30, okay? So I'll correct the maximum. Uh, angle of deviation present in um, the isotropic day. Here, sensory, uh, sensory iso and sensory exo, it is because of sensory deprivation. And here it is extremely important because it, it may be a sign of um, retinoblastoma. Okay, uh, retinoblastoma may be evident by iso deviation like that. So, in any case of iso deviation, you should consider retinoblastoma. As, uh, as being the etiology. In the case of sensory isotropia, you should consider retroblastoma at first. Divergence insufficiency. Here, I do have, uh, um, I do have uh, here the isotropia evident in, in far vision. So in far vision, you do have isotropia. This is called divergence insufficiency. It is greater at distance than at near. There are two forms. Here, a primary, which is uh, isolated form, and a secondary, a secondary divergence insufficiency. Here, this secondary may be related to mild sixth nerve paresis. Okay, it is not that evident sixth nerve paresis, but may be due to neurological abnormality, especially if you have mild sixth nerve paresis. This is called convergence. Uh, this is called, sorry, this is called divergence insufficiency. Uh, actually, this uh, occurs in um, uh, this uh, this occurs in, in, in uh, older age, and this is called age-related distance isotropia. Okay, here uh, the patient uh, patients typically are older than fifty years, and the diplopia will be evident at distance, but not uh, there is no diplopia at near. Here we treat this um, divergence insufficiency by relieving prismas which are based out prismas or Botox, here base out prisms will, will give the, the, the focus or will give the, the image on the fovea. Okay, so they are a form of relieving prism. Botox also, Botox injection of the medial rectus and strabismus surgery may be required. After that, I may have a spasm of the near reflex, which is called ciliary spasm or convergence uh, spasm. Here, the near reflex is consisting of three issues, accommodation, meiosis, and also uh, conversions. Uh, and here, uh, this is uh, somehow common due to psychological factors like stress and anxiety. Also, in rare cases, it may be associated with organic diseases. I have con uh, uh, excessive conversions, increased accommodation and meiosis, so the three components of the near reflex will be increased. Uh, also, here, monocular abduction is, is normal. Here, the abduction is normal, but um, uh, but here I do have what I do have uh, marked limitation of abduction on version testing. So the monocular one is good, but the binocular one is bad. Okay, 
Also here, I do have pseudomyopia. What do you mean by pseudomyopia? The patient in, in autorefractometer will give me minus five, for example, minus five diopter. And actually this patient or this child is orthotropic. This, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, this uh, child is, is emmetropic. Uh, so this child is zero. I have no significant refractive error. What about this minus five? It is due to excessive accommodation. Here the patient or the child has excessive accommodation. So the image is in front of the retina like that. So this is called pseudomyopia. The treatment uh, mainly by cycloplegic uh, agents in order to uh, decrease uh, this accommodation reflex or this reflex, such as atropine or homotropine or hypropic correction and bifocal glasses. Here, hypropic correction together with cycloplegic due to what? Uh, because this or bifocal glasses, bifocal glasses especially uh, uh, due to what? Because um, actually I, I prescribe cycloplegic agents for these uh, children or these patients. And uh, actually, if they are studying or uh, somewhat um, uh, 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 they, they won't have any element of accommodation, so I prescribe, I do prescribe bifocal glasses together with this. Also, counseling to address the underlying psychological issues may be helpful in, in these patients. The spasm cannot be broken. Botox uh, of the medial rectus and strabismus surgery may be considered with caution. Um, what about consecutive uh, isotropia? Consecutive mean, mean that I, I did have exodeviation at first and spontaneously, which is extremely rare, this exodeviation is, um, uh, is converted into isodeviation, okay? So uh, this is called the spontaneous uh, consecutive isodeviation, which is extremely rare. Commonly, it occurs after surgery. After we do uh, exodeviation surgery, the patient had isodeviation. This is due to overcorrection or due to uh, muscle uh, loss or muscle slippage, okay? Do, uh, we should consider lateral uh, rectus uh, muscle uh, slippage. If the lateral rectus is uh, slipped or lost, uh, we will have the patient like that post-operatively. So uh, this, this will result in consecutive isodeviation, okay? Here, um, initial small overcorrection is desirable after surgery. So if you have small overcorrection, you should wait for uh, at least three to six months uh, um, as this is a favorable outcome. And this, uh, actually this overcorrection may be, may be spontaneously resolved. Treatment options for uh, consecutive ESO deviation is based out PRISM, which is relieving PRISM, hypropic correction, alternating occlusion in order to eliminate diplopia, which is uh, called paradoxical diplopia. Diplopia uh, at first in cases of exo was, um, uh, was uh, heteronomous or cross diplopia. And after the surgery, it is uh, homonomous or uncrossed diplopia. So here it is called paradoxical diplopia. In order to eliminate this paradoxical diplopia, you should do alternating without prism or Botox or alternating occlusion and even strabismus surgery may be needed if you um, if the, the period is uh, over six months and the patient is still complaining of diplopia. And post-surgical consecu consecutive isotropia, unless the deviation is very large or slip, here, if it is very large, you should uh, operate uh, uh, early. If uh, the muscle is slipped or lost, this uh, also will, uh, will require immediate, but uh, unless uh, you have large angle or you have slipped or lost muscle, uh, you should wait. Okay, here um, uh, you have here both, or you have here two possibilities of overcorrection. Look at this one. After the surgery, the patient had exotro exodeviation. And after the surgery, we have what? We have the patient like that, has ESO deviation like that. The patient has ESO deviation. What is the reason behind this ESO deviation? Maybe due to very tight medial rectus. So here I have tightened the medial rectus more than enough. Or I may have lost or slipped lateral rectus. Here I have slipped lateral rectus. How can you differentiate between them? Actually, it is uh, easily to be differentiated through the forced duction test. Here, forced duction test in cases of uh, uh, tight medial rectus will be 
uh, will be positive because here I do have restriction of movement. But uh, in the slipped lateral rectus, it will be negative. So I'll move this eye freely to the lateral side uh, in cases of slipped lateral rectus. But in cases of uh, tight medial rectus, here the eye will be, won't be uh, moved easily. This is how to differentiate between them. Uh, actually, I have nystagmus and esotropia. I have fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome. I mentioned this, which is called la uh, manifest latent or latent nystagmus. I have also scientia with abducting nystagmus of, uh, um, uh, of low amplitude and high frequency. And I have also nystagmus blockade syndrome. What about nystagmus blockade syndrome? Here, nystagmus blockade syndrome, I do have the primary disease is congenital nystagmus, congenital motor nystagmus. And here the patient is uh, adducting his eyes like that in order to dampen the nystagmus because here this one or this uh, position, in this position, the patient will have what? The patient will, will reach the null point. So the null point is in the adduction like that. Okay, and this is the null point. Uh, so in order to dampen this nystagmus, the patient will develop ESO deviation. So this is called nystagmus blockage syndrome. So the ESO is uh, a defense mechanism against uh, uh, nystagmus. This is called nystagmus blockage syndrome. Okay. Uh, the last one, which is incomitant uh, ESO deviation, I have here sixth nerve palsy, or I have a restrictive or other causes like the wind retraction syndrome, which will be mentioned in um, uh, in uh, the part of special syndromes. But before this, we will talk about the sixth nerve palsy. Sixth nerve palsy, I do have five signs and five symptoms. Actually, the symptoms are the signs. So the patient is complaining of conversion squint uh, due to paralysis of the lateral rectus, limitation of lateral movement due to also paralysis of the lateral rectus. Uh, here, this deviation will be greater uh, will, will develop greater secondary angle deviation. So this is called the incomitant one. Um, I do have also uh, uncrossed uh, diplopia because it is ESO, and we mentioned this before. I have false projection. I have this turn towards the side of the squinting eye. Okay, these are symptoms and, this, uh, and actually they are uh, the signs. And how can you differentiate between this sixth nerve pulse and Duane retraction syndrome? This will be mentioned while we are discussing Duane retraction syndrome uh, shortly after. Okay, but before this, uh, look at this uh, patient here. Look at this one. It has mild isodeviation. Look at this eye. It has mild isodeviation like that. Okay, look, look at the reflex. The reflex here, it is not central. It is at the pupil border. Okay, if the patient is looking here, uh, you, you notice that this eye won't move. So here the angle of strabismus will be increased. This means that the secondary angle is uh, over or is, uh, is uh, larger than that of uh, uh, the primary angle of strabismus. When the patient is looking here to uh, the left, to his left, this patient won't have strabismus at all because here he has intact medial rectus. Also, he has intact uh, uh, contralateral lateral rectus. And this is a type of diplopia. Look at this one. Here, the diplopia. Uh, this part, or this, this circle, uh, in relation to the deviated eye, look at the deviated eye. This is the visual axis of the devi deviated eye. This will uh, lie temporal to the visual axis. Okay, so it will stimulate an easel element like that to be seen more temporal like that. Okay, this is uh, uh, how, look at, look at this one. The right eye will see the, the image to the right, the left eye will see the image to the left. This is called uncrossed. You can't see any cross here. It is called uncrossed or homonomous diplopia. This is the end of um, uh, this is the end of um, uh, the ESO deviation. Let's uh, make some MCQs about this. Parents bring their uh, three-year-old boy for examination, having noticed a squint. It has been present throughout the day since he was two years old. So here, uh, the st strabismus uh, was when this this child has just one year because here he has three year old. Okay, he's three year old, and uh, the strabismus was two years ago, uh, or since he was two years old. Actually, when he was two years old, this is typical 
poor um, accommodative. But look at this one, a brief, a brief inspection of the child shows an obvious right constant moderate angle, moderate angle here, this is extremely evident, moderate angle because it is also typical. It is below 30 present per unlike that of uh, the congenital one, it is uh, higher than 40 or higher than 30. Here, uh, typically it is lower than 30 here in, in cases of accommodative ESO. A cycloplegic refraction is performed and reveals plus 8.5 diopter in both eyes. This is uh, um, a typical. This is a typical case of accommodative, refractive accommodative ESO deviation. The deviation will definitely be greater at near than at distance? No, I don't know. Because here, I don't know the AC per A ratio. Here, you must tell me about the AC per A ratio to determine whether the deviation will be greater at near uh, um, or greater at near than at distance. There may be bilateral amblyopia. Uh, yes, they may be, be bilateral amblyopia because here I do have 8.5 diopter uh, sphere in, in, in both eyes. So this is the true one. Plus three diopter lenses are likely to significantly reduce the distance deviation. No, here because the patient has um, uh, to, to, to have the full cycloplegic refraction in order to listen and reduce the distance deviation. The deviation is distance, a uh, distance is likely to measure uh, above 50 present diopters. No, this is typical in, in cases of uh, infantile, but it is not typical in cases of accommodative isotropia. Typically, it is moderate angle, it is not that large. A seven year old boy presents via his opticians with visual acuity of 66 right eye, 615 left eye. Motility is full, and there is no apparent tropia uh, on cover and cover test. Okay, the child has a stereo acuity of uh, uh, 120 seconds per arc, which is uh, below normal. Here, the normal will be 16, sorry, 60 seconds per arc or one minute of arc. So uh, here, this this uh, stereopsis is somehow uh, deficient, uh, somehow subnormal. Okay, distance worse for the testing reveals. Fusion. Here, the distance reveals uh, fusion. Convergence and divergence amplitudes are normal. At distance, there is no movement detected when a four. This is the, the diagnostic one. Uh, there is no movement detected when a four uh, present doctor is placed over uh, the left eye. This is a repeated one, which is uh, the patient has monofixation syndrome. What additional finding is most likely? Here, the question is another thing. Limitation of uh, elevation. More marked in adduction? No, this is characteristic of Brown syndrome, and this is not Brown syndrome. Retraction of uh, the globe on adduction, this is characteristic of Duane retraction syndrome, and this is not Duane. High axial myopia bilaterally? No, this is uh, not uh, evident here. And hypropic anisometropia? Yes, this is uh, accompanied by monofixation syndrome. So, most cases of monofixation syndrome, or there is association between hypropic anisometropia and um, monofixation syndrome or microtropia. For uh, astrabismus to be appropriately termed congenital here, this is extremely easy. It is within the first six months of life. Uh, which statement regarding pediatric ophthalmology evaluation? Here, Cardiff is reasonable for testing acuity of one year old. Yes, this is uh, good. A child with eccentric fixation will usually have vision. If the eccentric fixation is clinically evident, the vision must be 660 or worse. And I mentioned this also before. The cover and cover test is used to identify uh, uh, atropia. Yes, identify atropia and also identify folia, both of them. Temporal displacement of uh, uh, the light reflex that doesn't shift during cover and cover. Here, temporal uh, doesn't shift during cover and cover. This means that it may be apparent. Uh, uh, deviation. But temporal displacement, look at this one, represent a positive angle kappa? No, it is negative angle kappa because normally it is uh, it is nasal, somehow like that. Normally it is nasal, okay? The reflex is slightly nasal. It will intersect the cornea uh, nasal to the center of the pupil. If it is temporal like that, this is called negative angle kappa. If it is more nasal, it is called positive angle kappa. So this one is the false one. A patient with right isotropia measuring 50 present doctor for near and 34 distance would like to have a squint surgery. This patient uh, would like to have a squint surgery. There is no previous history of surgical correction. 
On the basis of the clinical information provided above, which procedure is most likely to be appropriate here? The problem is in, is, is in near, uh, if the problem is in near, you should do the surgery on the medial rectus. If the problem is more in far, we should uh, do the surgery for lateral rectus. So here bilateral medial, bilateral medial rectus recession. This is uh, the good option. A patient diagnosed with persistent intractable knee reflex spasm. Which of the following knee reflex spasm is treated by atropine? This is logic. Um, 18 month old child attend a clinic with her parents who have a report a six month history of squint. Okay, examination findings are as follows. Here, the, 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 the date is extremely important. Six month history of squint. This means that the squint is, starts at the age of one year. This is more typical for accommodative, not congenital. But here, good fixation, either eye. This means that she, she has alternating uh, strabismus or alternating fixation. Uh, the prism cover test reveals 40 prism after ISO at near and at distance. There is no difference. Cycloplegic refraction is just a plus two. Um, um, although the cycloplegic, uh, cycloplegic refraction is just a plus two, we should do uh, this prescription. So I should prescribe plus two glasses in both eyes. This will be extremely important here in order to uh, discover whether it is accommodative or it is partially accommodative. Here uh, in, uh, in in this case, it, it may be partially accommodative, but here the, the most important or, or appropriate next step is just to prescribe the full cycloplegic refraction in both eyes. Clinical features of a childhood uh, isotropia that are predictive of the need of future surgery intervention include all of the following. Here, low hypropia, this will, um, uh, this, this will uh, indicate the need of surgery after correction. So you correct for this low hypropia, like the, the previous example. You should correct, at first you should correct, but surgery will be indicated or will be likely indicated. Large angle Isotropia, yes, this, uh, these large angles won't be corrected alone by glasses. So you will need also intervention. The presence of overaction uh, of the inferior uh, obliques. Here, the presence of inferior oblique overaction, this will also um, uh, demanding surgical correction. The age of onset between two and three years. No, this is uh, likely to, to be accommodative, not likely to be uh, congenital or non-accommodative element. All of the following are typically associated with microtropia except small angle manifest deviation. Yes, this, this is uh, evident. Microtropia, as, as we told, it is uh, um, a small angle, which is between eight to uh, 10 prism diopters like that. Central suppression scotoma. Yes, this is evident in cases of uh, microtropia or monofixation syndrome. Anomalous threatening correspondence, yes, in order to, uh, in order to uh, 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 retain some good of, or some, some sort of good binocularity. Um, myopia, no, here microtropia, it is associated with uh, anisometropic hypropia. Anisometropic hypropia, so myopia here is, is the false one. Reduced stereopsis, yes, the stereopsis will be uh, subnormal. All of the following are typical findings of infantile isotropia, except uh, 40 prism diopter. Yes, this is uh, compatible with infantile, large angle, okay? Plus four, no, this is not compatible. This is not compatible. If uh, the cycloplegic refraction is uh, indicating high hypermetropia, um, uh, this, this will be, this child will have uh, accommodative element or this child will have accommodative uh, isodeviation. Inferior oblique overaction, yes. Full dull's head eye movement, yes. This is also evident. I have no restrictions. Nystagmus on occluding one eye with fast face towards the fixing eye, yes. This is called manifest latent nystagmus, as we mentioned before. Parents bring their three year old uh, boy for examination, having noticed a squint. It has been present throughout the day since he was two years old. Uh, a cursory inspection reveals an obvious isotropia, which appears larger when the child plays with an object in his hands. Cycloplegic refraction reveals plus 1.5 in both eyes. Which of the following is false? Look at this one. Here, uh, his age is three-year-old, okay? And here, um, uh, the 
the squint has been present throughout the day since he was two years old. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, I have examin examination or inspection. I have obvious isotopia appears larger when the child plays with. So here, th this child has convergence excess isotropia. This isotropia will be more apparent when the child uh, plays with an object in his hands. Cycloplegic is just plus 1.5. So this uh, child has high AC peer aeration, convergence excess. Deviation at near is likely to be moderate between uh, 20 to 30 present diopters. Yes, this may be true. Uh, the deviation at near is likely to be lessened with plus three. Yes, this is the treatment, which is bifocal or near glasses. AC per air issue is uh, of four is compatible with this case. No, here it must be higher than normal. Four is the, the normal value. Uh, and five is the, 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 the normal limit. Above five, it is abnormal. And he, here, this patient must have high AC peer aeration. Division distance is not likely to be large. This is also true. Which of the following statement about cyclic isotropia is false? Ambliopia is possible, but relatively uncommon. Yes, here, uh, ambliopia is uncommon because I have also a tropic day, but maybe uh, may, may occur. Okay, it is not 100% uh, excluded in these cases. The angle of deviation is generally moderate. Yes, this is also evident. Uh, full hypropic correction may correct the isotropia if it is uh, accommodative or it has accommodative element. Yes, uh, the age of onset is similar to accommodative isotropia. Yes, this is also uh, true. Look at uh, the, the, the final one. The cycle consists of one week or isotropia, one week iso. Uh, tropia, no, it is one day bad, one day good, one day good, one day bad. So um, uh, this is the false one. So the cycle uh, as a whole, it is 48 hours. Actually, the cycle may be, this is the, the typical one, but the cycle uh, may, in, in some rare cases, have uh, another values. It may have uh, just 24 hours, which is uh, 12 hours uh, or so, and 12 hours ISO. This is not important. Typically, it is 48, one day and one day. The findings below are all consistent with a patient who has uh, right microtropia with, with identity. What do you mean by right microtropia with identity? Here, with identity mean that he has uh, Abnorm uh, he has uh, anomalous retinal correspondence, which is uh, uh, which is uh, sufficient enough to um, to cause central suppression scotoma, or or it equals the the angle of central suppression scotoma. So if you do cover and cover test, the patient won't have any movement. So look at number B, which is flick movement on cover test. No, this is called what? This is called this is called without identity. If the angle of uh, uh, anomalous retinal correspondence is below that of the central suppression scotoma, or um, uh, or um, uh, it is below, yes, it is below that of the central suppression scotoma, this is called, um, this will result in movement on cover testing. Uh, here, the patient uh, will have reduced the striopsis right eccentric fixation, yes, maybe normal, or maybe present, sorry, no movement when, a four uh, present diopter uh, base out is placed before the right eye. Yes, this is evident in cases of uh, uh, microtropia. Also, anisometropia or hypropic anisometropia may be evident. A 12 year old girl has a symptomatic convergence excess isotropia. She is not keen on surgery or botox. Here, uh, she has convergence excess. Convergence excess. It means that she has high AC peer air ratio. So here, what is the, the appropriate treatment? The appropriate treatment is just bifocals. I give her plus three near glasses, and she will be OK. OK, that is for the ESO deviation. Let's talk about the exo deviation. Like that of the ESO deviation, and in cases of exo deviation, I have also false and true. I have false exodivision. What are the causes of false exodivision? Here, um, uh, it is the reverse of that of um, ESO1, which is uh, uh, long or uh, very high interpupillary distance. Okay, so here both eyes are very distant from each other, and this may give the, the false impression of having ESO, uh, sorry, exodivision. 
Uh, this is the first one. The second one, I may have positive angle kappa. And look at this one. This is called positive angle kappa. If you do have more temporal dragging, like that more temporal dragging of the fovea, here you will, you will have this intersecting one, which will be in red. I'll make it in red like Kansky. Uh, it will be here more nasal than usual. If it is more nasal than usual, in cases of temporal dragging, like that of retinopathy or prematurity or fever, familial exudative vitreal retinopathy and so on, uh, you will get what you will get positive angle kappa and this will give you an impression of um, uh, uh, divergence. Actually, this, uh, this is false impression. Both uh, optical axes, look at the, the, the blue one, they are aligned with each other. Uh, both optical axes are aligned with, with each other. Actually, the problem here is in the dragging of the uh, macula to the temporal side like that, okay? Um, uh, let's uh, start with intermittent exudivation, which is the most important one because it is the most common. It is the most common type of manifest exudivation. It is the intermittent exotropia. Here, intermittent exotropia is uh, usually before the age, the start is usually before the age of uh, five years, becomes manifest during times of visual inattention and fatigue, like that of the forehead. A visual inattention, fatigue, stress at the end of the day, in, in daydreaming, if the patient or the child is tired, it is like for you, exactly like for you. Also, here's the trigger, maybe exposure to bright light. This is extremely important in MCQ. Exposure to bright light may trigger exudivation. And reflex occlusion of the eye, of one eye. Look at this one. Reflex occlusion of one eye in order to, to avoid diplopia. And that's why we can uh, cause these cases as having squint. And actually, you know that we have difference between the two terms. We have difference between strabismus and squint. Here, these um, uh, patients, if they close one eye, they are, they are. Um, um, that's why we can call them having as having squint. Actually, we can alternate between these terms, strabismus and squint. Uh, without differences. This is not important. Okay. Here, uh, types of exodivision, I have good control, which is the exotropia is done or, or, or is achieved actually after the cover test or only after the cover test. And it will recover spontaneously after we remove the cover. Something like the you. Okay. Uh, fair control, uh, uh, also done after the cover test, but it, it will, the patient will resume the confusion only after blinking or refixation. Okay, so uh, this, this will take seconds in order to be uh, aligned. Uh, the poor control, the exotropia may manifest spontaneously. I don't have to have or to do the cover test in order to make it evident. It may be evident spontaneously and it may remain manifest for an extended time. And this, this, uh, this one is the indication for surgery in cases of intermittent exotropia. Actually, uh, good and fair controls, uh, may uh, the, the surgery may be postponed or may be not needed at all. Uh, look at this one here, uh, prism and alternative uh, cover. Here, wh what about testing for these cases of intermittent exudivation? I shot test for near, I shot test for far at six uh, meters, here near 33 centimeters. Actually, I may uh, make the patient uh, look at a very distant object like uh, uh, an object from the window at a distance of 30 meters. Uh, this is extremely important. What is the importance of this? this? I want to differentiate between the angle in the, uh, in the distance or at distance and the angle at near. If they are the same, uh, this is called basic. I have three possibilities here. If they are the same, this is called basic uh, intermittent exudivation or intermittent exotropia. They are the same from the start. If they are not the same, if the patient has larger angle, look at this one, larger angle at distance. And this is logic, larger angle at, at distance. This means that, this mean that the patient has what we call divergence excess. But this divergence excess may be false, may be true, okay? Because the patient has something called tenacious co uh, convergence. This tenacious convergence uh, must be eliminated. I must eliminate this. I, I must uh, disrupt this convergence at first or this, this tenacious fusion at first. And after I disrupt this, this, this occurs actually at, uh, at near. After I disrupt this, I retest it again. I disrupt this by patching. I do patching of one eye 
uh, for um, a period of from 30 to 60 minutes. And after I do this, I'll disrupt this tenacious fusion. And after I disrupt this tenacious fusion, I retest. If the angles are the same, this means that you have uh, uh, falls. If they are the same for distance and for, for near, and this, this is called false divergence excess. So actually, I don't have divergence excess. Actually, I, I do have false divergence excess. Okay. Um, if uh, uh, the angle of far, uh, actually, most cases are simulated or false divergence excess. Most cases are like that. But in rare cases, you have divergence through divergence excess. What do you mean by true divergence excess? The angle uh, at far or at distance will be larger than of the angle at near, which will be smaller, okay? So uh, here, uh, this is uh, important. This is called the true divergence excess. After you do this, uh, you may outline the reason behind this true divergence excess, which may be due to high AC per air issue. So uh, if you want to, to determine whether it is due to high AC per air issue, you should do uh, the test before and after plus three. You do plus three in order to eliminate accommodation at near, in order to uh, eliminate uh, the convergence, which is uh, which may be high here in these cases. So you do uh, here this one in order to uh, determine whether it is uh, due to high ACP issue or not. Okay, this is uh, uh, these are or this is the algorithm. So at first you you should you should uh, measure the angle at far or at distance and at near, okay? If they are the same or nearly the same, if they are within 10 prism that are from each other, they are nearly the same, this is called basic one. If they are not the same, if they are not the same, you do what? Uh, I'll do patching at first. And after patching, I have two possibilities. After patching here, I have two possibilities. I have either true divergence excess or pseudo, which is more common, pseudo divergence excess. Okay, in cases of true divergence excess, after I diagnose this one, I'll do uh, the, the, I'll measure, remeasure the angle before and after plus three. Okay, I'll do plus three and remeasure the angle again at distance and at four. Here, uh, this uh, uh, will uh, indicate whether I have high AC per air issue or not. Okay, I may have high AC per air issue, I may not have high AC per air issue. This is the algorithm which is extremely important. These are the three slides like that. Um, what about the treatment here? I do spectacle correction for, for these cases in, in myopic patients because myopia uh, may, be, uh, may have etiologic rule, so you should correct myopia. Actually, you may overcorrect, you may overcorrect the, the, myo the myopic uh, patients by minus two diopters over correction by minus two. What is the value of this? If I add minus two, the patient, if I add more minus two, the patient, this will force the patient to accommodate. And this accommodation will result in controlling the, exudiv the exudivation. Here, uh, the, 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 the accommodation will be accompanied by convergence. So this convergence will control the diplopia. So this will control the disease. Actually, if I have here uh, hypropia, I may leave the hypropia. I may leave the hypropia, but if its value is uh, below uh, four diopters, because if the hypropia is, is uh, four diopter or above four diopter, if it is above or equaling four diopters, if I leave this hypropia, this will be likely related to or accompanied by amblyopia. This may have amblyopia with it, okay? Uh, Part-time occlusion, this is uh, uh, important of the non-deviating eye, may improve the amblyopia, okay? Here, I may improve, improve the amblyopia. If I improve the amblyopia, the, the, the deviation may improve. Uh, and this, this was mentioned, treatment of the amblyopia, some, sometimes the treatment of amblyopia is sufficient to uh, treat uh, the strabismus, and the reverse is not correct, okay? The reverse is not uh, is not evident. If uh, you do the strabismus surgery, you should do amblyopia treatment. So you 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 cannot just depend on the treatment or the surgical treatment of uh, strabismus alone. You should treat amblyopia uh, with uh, um, with strabismus. But the reverse is is, is good, which is uh, treatment of amblyopia may may lessen or enhance 
or improve the strabismus. Um, what about surgery here? Here, uh, like that of the ESO, I'll do it for the exo, so I may do uh, uh, recession of the lateral uh, rectus, or I may do uh, resection of the medial rectus. I may do bilateral recession of uh, the, the lateral rectus, or, or uh, I may do here, uh, I may work on just one eye. If the angle is uh, large, I'll, I'll act, um, I'll act on, on more than three muscles or, or more than two muscles, three or four in the primary. And this is uh, important. Some cases of correction by myopia, I, I told you this, by two to four uh, diopters can simulate, can stimulate accommodation, accommodative conversions. This is uh, also, uh, uh, I told you this before. Okay. Um, here, uh, convergence insufficiency. What about convergence insufficiency? Here, the patient has, it is the reverse of convergence excess. The, the patient has extremely low AC per A ratio. So the patient and uh, at, at far, uh, the patient is good. Okay, the patient at near, he has exodeviation or some sort of exodeviation. So the exodeviation will be manifest more in uh, near. This is called convergence insufficiency. Okay, or, or, or the diplopia, not the, the, the not, not even, uh, or, or not that evident strabismus, but just amblyopia. The amblyopia will be more evident in, in near than at four. Okay, convergence insufficiency is a common complication of Parkinson. Uh, Parkinson disease. This is extre extremely important one in MCQs. Here it, it may be related to, it may be a complication of Parkinson uh, disease. Uh, the treatment for this, it is orthoptic exercise. I, I showed the exercise, this eye to fuse in like that. So I may do what, I may give the base out prism. What is the value of base out prism? It will get, uh, give uh, the eye exercise in order to be fused uh, here in order to be converged here. Base out prism will result in convergence like that. Or I may uh, stimulate convergence by the pencil push-up. I, I approximate a pencil in front of um, uh, uh, the patient's eye and this will induce, uh, this will induce what? This will induce convergence. If this exercise fail, we do relieving prism, which is based in prism. Um, uh, reading glasses may alleviate symptoms. Reading prism, reading glasses, or, or relieving prism, based in prism, reading glasses. Surgical treatment, usually medial rectus resection, may be indicated in patients whose problem persists despite medical therapy. This is convergence insufficiency. The most important one it is about the treatment and also the association with Parkinson's syndrome. Uh, constant or early, early onset extropia is extremely rare, rarer than that of um, uh, the uh, congenital or early onset ESO, but here, if it is present, neurological abnormalities should be addressed. Okay, neurological abnormalities are frequently present, so uh, MRI is always um, or almost uh, required in these cases. What about sensory exotropia? It is like that of uh, sensory deprivation. Uh, ESO, it is like, um, or it is due to cataract or any media opacity, vitreous hemorrhage, retina detachment, and so on. This will result in, uh, this will result in uh, um, deviation out or deviation in and so on. Consecutive exo deviation and the treatment of this one, which is sensory exotropia, it is treatment of the cause. Um, consecutive exotropia, like also like that of uh, consecutive ESO, the patient has or had ESO from the start and uh, spontaneously he developed exo. This is rare. This is called the spontaneous uh, consecutive ESO uh, uh, exodivation. Uh, and uh, the other cause is after surgery. Consecutive means that it is mainly after surgery. The patient has ESO and after surgery he had exo deviation. So here uh, in the surgery like that of um, like that of uh, uh, the ESO one, you should uh, exclude large angles. If the angle is large, then the surgery is indicated. You should exclude also muscle slippage 
or uh, muscle loss, especially if you, uh, in cases of ESO, if you uh, were working on the medial rectus muscle, it, it will be very easy to be lost and also it is uh, very hard to be found. So you should exclude muscle slippage and large angles because if you, if you do have these uh, elements, or these possibilities, surgery will be indicated immediately. But uh, if you don't have this, you should wait, uh, uh, waiting for spontaneous recovery. Actually, in cases of uh, consecutive exo, spontaneous recovery is rare, so you should do your workup and treatment. Uh, DHD, which is dissociated horizontal deviation, it is a part of uh, um, uh, another important term, which is called dissociated strabismus complex, DSC. A dissociated strabismus complex may uh, include DVD, dissociated vertical division, which is uh, uh, the, the, the common one. Uh, also, this DVD may be associated with DHD, dissociated horizontal, or DTD, with, which is dissociated torsional deviation. Okay, it is treat, treated according to, um, according to uh, the, the involved ones. Convergence paralysis. If it is DVD, actually you, you may do uh, anteriorization of the uh, oblique muscles, inferior oblique muscle. If it is DHD, uh, you may work on the horizontal muscles and so on. Convergence paralysis. Uh, it is a different uh, entity from convergence insufficiency. So, so there is difference between convergence insufficiency and different and uh, converge, convergence uh, paralysis. Here it is related to dorsal midbrain. It is related to neurological or intracranial lesion. Typically, it is association with dorsal midbrain perineal syndrome. Okay, it is called uh, convergence paralysis. So, in in this uh, case, the patient has what the patient on attempted uh, uh, convergence. Okay, the patient will will get divergence like that. Okay, uh, there there will be divergence on attempted. Uh, convergence. If the patient is aware of a near object, he will con uh, diverge instead of having convergence. Look at the, the, the uh, abduction. The abduction in both eyes will be intact. Here the patient is, uh, uh, is having intact abduction. The problem is just in convergence. This is called, this is in the reverse of internuclear ophthalmoplegia. In INO, the patient has normal convergence and has abnormal uh, abduction. Okay, uh, you know, the, the patient has adduction deficit with normal conversions. Here, this one, which is convergence paralysis in cases of uh, dorsal midbrain perineal syndrome, it will have uh, the reverse. Actually, this, is, this one is extremely important. Here, the patient may have uh, malingering. The patient is, uh, um, um, the, patient, uh, the patient doesn't have this disease. He uh, is simulating this disease by having divergence like that uh, when he reads. Uh, he doesn't want to study, he doesn't want to, to read, so he has this malingering uh, uh, movement of uh, this eye. In order to differentiate between them, look at the pupil. If the pupil is constricted, this means that the patient is uh, having knee reflex, and it will be impossible, it will be very impossible to be uh, malingering. If the patient has normal pupil, which is not constricted, this means that this, this child or this patient is malingering. So this is important one. Treatment is uh, actually it is not uh, we we don't have many options we just do based in prism in order to uh, in order to alleviate or in order to uh, eliminate the diplopia you just do uh, based against deviation based in prism okay that is the end of exudivation let's talk about special syndromes I have here an important entity, which is called the congenital cranial disinnervation disorders. They are a group of uh, diseases which share in, in having defect in, in one or more cranial nerves. They are extremely important. And the most important one, it is the Duane retraction syndrome. Let's uh, talk about Duane retraction syndrome. It's extremely important in uh, uh, questions. You know, there is no exam without Duane retraction syndrome. Okay, here in all types of doing, I have co contraction, anomalous co contraction of the medial and the lateral rectus. Here, if you do uh, medial and lateral rectus, if laterally they are contracting with each other, this is uh, this obeyment of the Sherrington law. So, here in, in Sherrington law, you uh, if you do have lateral rectus contraction, the medial rectus should 
should uh, has should have inhibition. Okay, this is uh, logic, and this is the Sherrington law. Here there is this obeyment. I have medial and lateral rectus co-contraction on uh, actual or attempted uh, abduction. If the patient is abducting uh, the involved eye, uh, this will result in co-contraction, and this will cause retraction of the globe because the medial and the lateral look at look at this one here the globe is attached to the medial and it, it is attached to the lateral if they are contracted to each with each other the globe will be retracted uh, like that it won't be moved like that or like that it will be retracted to the inner part or towards the orbital apex okay uh, this is called uh, Duane retraction that's why we call it Duane retraction syndrome because in an attempted med medial rotation or an attempted abduction of the involved eye i'll have what i'll have retraction of the group because of the co-contraction between the medial and the lateral look at this one which is uh, also important one i may have upshoot or downshoot and this is because of slippage of the uh, horizontal muscles like the lateral rectus muscle, which may be above or below uh, its normal uh, position. And this was evident by MRI. So here I may have upshoot or downshoot uh, when uh, the, the, the eye which is involved with is uh, attempted to adapt. Okay. Um, what about the uh, Harbor classification or Harbor classification of, um, um, of uh, Duane retraction? I have type one, type two, and type three. Type one, I know that you know all uh, that you all know this mnemonic, which is uh, having one D, which is uh, limited abduction. Abduction, the word abduction has only one D. And uh, in type two, I have limited adduction. I have two Ds, so it is type two. Uh, and uh, type three, I have limited uh, adduction and abduction, so I have three Ds. I know that you all know this mnemonic. This, this is uh, easy one. Type one, which is the most common type two, it, it is the least common, uh, don't, uh, uh, don't forget about this. Okay. Uh, look at uh, look at this slide here. I do have force type. This may be considered or classified as, as force type, but it is not uh, according to our classification, which is uh, um, here uh, uh, usually exotropia when the affected eye looks in the direction that should result in abduction. So on attempted abduction, this will result in abduction or exodivision. And uh, this is called, uh, this is called what? This is called uh, bizarre motility, or this is called ocular splits, or this is called the force type of the wind retraction syndrome. This is not that important. The, imp the important one, which is here, type one, uh, uh, it is the most common from 50 to 80% of cases in several series. Observation of the globe retraction here, it is uh, important on abduction of VITs the need for neurological investigation for sex nerve palsy. Here, what is the difference between sex nerve palsy? What the difference between sex nerve palsy and Duane retraction syndrome? Here, in cases of the sex nerve palsy, I do have manifest angle here in the primary position. Here in the primary position, this eye is deviated in like that. So here I do have what I do have left sex nerve palsy. This is the first difference. In, in cases of Duane retraction syndrome, you do have what? You do have normal uh, alignment in the primary position. It, it may, uh, you may have slight easy division, by the way, but uh, the typical is normal. Typically, you have normal alignment in the primary position. This is number one. Number two, in cases of the wind retraction syndrome, here, uh, if you have, uh, if you want to uh, have abduction of this eye, it, it will be limited, okay? This is, uh, actually, this is evident in both cases. This is evident in, in sex nerve palsy, and also this is evident in, in what, in sex, uh, in, in, in Duane retraction syndrome. The difference here, when you look at the other side, look at the other side, here the medial rectus is intact, but here the medial rectus will have another co-contraction with the lateral rectus, so, so the globe will be retracted, and you will have here, narrowing of the palpebral fissure. Look at the palpebral fissure here, it will be somehow narrow. And also this uh, eye will be moved like that, okay? So uh, uh, this will result in what? This will result in narrowing of the palpebral fissure. This will result in also globe retraction. So you have globe retraction, you have narrowing of the, the palpebral fissure. This eye will extend by the, the intact lateral rectus muscle here to uh, a grid value, but this won't extend to a grid value because here I do have contraction or co-contraction of both medial rectus and lateral rectus muscles. 
this co-contraction will result in slight exodegation. So in cases of uh, uh, abduction of the involved eye in type one doing, you, you may have slight exodeviation. Actually, in type one doing, it is ESO one, it is ESO deviation. Uh, because you have limited abduction like that, like that of uh, the uh, sixth nerve pulse. But in, in, in this cases, look at this one, look, look at this one. Here in the primary position, you don't have anything. Look at here, um, when attempted to look to the left, this eye, this left eye won't move. So here you have limited abduction, it is type one. Okay, look at this one, look at this one. When the patient is looking to uh, the right, here, the medial rectus is intact, but we do both co-contraction co with medial rectus and lateral rectus, so the globe will be retracted in like that. You will see also that the palpebral fissure here is narrower, narrower than that, okay? So uh, uh, this is the evidence. So uh, uh, this is extremely important because this uh, photo was typical in a previous ICO exam, and the differential diagnosis was between Duane retraction syndrome, left Duane retraction syndrome or left sex nerve palsy, and the answer was left Duane retraction syndrome. This is extremely important. Look, look here also, you, you have slight uh, exodeviation. This slight exodeviation is caused by uh, normal right eye, normal left rectus of the, uh, sorry, uh, normal lateral rectus of the right eye. And here uh, you do have co-contraction between the medial rectus and the lateral rectus. So you, you, ha you have no uh, full uh, movement of the medial rectus. This is not evident in all cases, okay? This is type one. In type two, you do have what here uh, in, in, in type two. Uh, the patient has uh, limited adduction. Look at this one. Here it is in the primary position with slight shooting or slight up shooting. Look at this one. And the patient is looking here. Here, uh, um, uh, there is normal uh, movement, somehow normal movement, or somehow slight limited abduction in, in this eye. But look at this one. Here, when the patient is looking here, uh, there is upshoot in, in attempted abduction. Also, uh, there is limited abduction. So there is limited abduction with upshooting. So this patient has right type 2 uh, Duane retraction syndrome. Um, Ambliopia, when present, is usually uh, the result of anisometropia rather, rather than strabismus, because here in the primary position, most patients are normal. So ambliopia, if you have ambliopia, if this patient has ambliopia, uh, this will be uh, a result of anisometropia, which is associated with this disease. Actually, this Duane retraction syndrome is associated with many uh, diseases like Golden Heart Syndrome with its association by itself, like uh, limbal dermoid and so on. Okay, uh, actually also um, type one Duane uh, is common in, in left eye. It is more common in left eye uh, than that of the uh, right eye. Most cases are um, having this disease in left eye. It is unilateral. Depending of, uh, on the clinical feature unilateral or bilateral medial rectus, uh, and lateral rectus muscle recessions. Here it is according to the type, according to uh, the clinical features. You, you may do uh, strabismus surgery, you may do horizontal strabismus surgery. Actually, you may, uh, if you do medial rectus, if you want to do medial rectus recession, it is uh, preferred to be done like a Faden operation rather than recession. And I mentioned this in the first uh, session. Okay, also you may transpose the vertical muscles. Here, um, this one is extremely important. The lateral rectus of involved side shouldn't be resected. Why uh, don't we do resection of this muscle? Let's imagine here that we, we have resection of this lateral rectus like that. I have resection, so I give the eye like that. So the eye will attempt to have uh, um, medial rotation like that in order to uh, be aligned. This is in case of uh, type one doing retraction syndrome. In case of type one doing retraction syndrome, I have limited abduction. If I do resection, the eye will attempt to do uh, abduction, which is intact. Here, the abduction will result in alignment. What is the problem here? In attempted abduction, this will increase what? This will increase the retraction of the globe. So um, this is extremely important. Lateral rectus 
uh, resection should be avoided. You should avoid lateral rectus resection in type 1 doing syndrome. Actually, in the American Academy, there are more details about the surgeries of uh, doing retraction syndrome, but this is sufficient. This is enough. Okay. Uh, Mobius syndrome. Mobius syndrome here, I do have bilateral six and seventh cranial nerve pulse. It is a sporadic. There is no pattern of inheritance. Uh, actually, um, I have expressionalist um, facial appearance and problems with eyelid uh, closure due to seventh nerve pulse. I have leg ophthalmos and I have no facial expression. Actually, from fifth to uh, twelve, I, I may have affection to these fifth, eighth, tenth, and also twelve uh, cranial nerve here with uh, limb abnormalities. Look at this tongue. This indicates twelve uh, nerve palsy. The ocular features: bilateral sixth nerve palsy, bilateral seventh nerve palsy, horizontal gaze palsy in uh, fifty percent of cases. Horizontal gaze palsy because I, I have what I I um, I have six nerve pulse in both eyes so uh, I don't have the ability to look to this side I don't have the ability to look to this side occasionally third and fourth nerve pulses and those are accompanying Mobius syndrome but Mobius syndrome is typically bilateral six nerve pulse strabismus fixus this is extremely easy um, here either the eye uh, uh, the eyes are fixed. Uh, like that uh, in, in the convergent state, or they are fixed in the divergent state. This is called strabismus fixus. Congenital and acquired forms have been described. Congenital fibrosis of extraocular muscles. Here it is mostly autosomal dominant. Type 1 is the commonest type 1 of congenital fibrosis of extraocular muscles. Uh, here it is, uh, 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 I have hypoplastic superior division of the oculomotor nerve. Uh, which results in or which result from mutation uh, or genetic mutation. So it is genetic mutation, autosomal dominant, uh, cranial nerve uh, maldevelopment. Here I have maldevelopment of the oculomotor nerve or hypoplastic superior division of the oculomotor nerve, which is uh, typical. I may have also horizontal, um, I may have horizontal uh, um, associations with these cases. Look at this, ptosis is common. Look at this, also horizontal deviation is common. Look at another uh, issue, which is uh, the, uh, the both primary position, both eyes will be uh, fixed here below the horizontal line by about 10 degrees. So I have hypotropia on both eyes in uh, primary position and ptosis is common. This is a congenital fibrosis of extracular muscles. Um, I have also monocular elevation deficiency or mid, uh, formerly they are called like double elevator palsy, but this entity is not that accurate because here the problem, the primary problem may be due to, um, maybe uh, uh, due to uh, tight or contracted inferior rectus muscle. So here I, I don't have paralysis or it may be due, uh, due to also paralysis of superior rectus. So I, I may have double elevator palsy or I may have just tight or contracted or restricted inferior rectus muscles. So this uh, entity, the, 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 the good entity, or the good term is monocular elevation deficiency rather than double elevator palsy. Also here, uh, inability to elevate one eye across the horizontal plane from, mm, from side to side. And this is a difference between it and Brown syndrome. Look at this one. Here the patient cannot elevate his eyes in the primary position. Also, the patient cannot elevate his eyes in adduction and also in abduction. So here the patient uh, uh, cannot elevate his eye in, in all positions. This is called monoocular uh, elevation deficiency or mid. Uh, also, uh, phoria in the primary position in about one third of cases. So here in the primary position, the, the patient may have uh, no problem. Actually, you can uh, prescribe this up prism. This may be helpful as a relieving prism. Here, Brown syndrome, here the elevation palsy or the elevation uh, deficiency is in adduction. Due to what? Here, I don't have um, uh, inferior uh, oblique insufficiency and I don't have a superior oblique overaction. I just have tight uh, trochlea, okay, or tight tendon of the superior. The problem is in the tendon of the superior oblique muscle. It is not in the muscle itself. So I don't have overaction of the superior oblique muscle and this will be evident in the MCQs. Okay, I just have tight tendon 
in the trochlea here. The tendon is somehow uh, uh, trapped. So the eye will be trapped in the inferior uh, position, or you 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 you, uh, you you don't have, or you don't have a full uh, elevation. The patient cannot elevate his eyes in. Uh, uh, the position of abduction. What about the abduction? The abduction is normal. So the patient can elevate his eyes uh, on abduction. Um, I have a congenital, which may be idiopathic or may be related to congenital click syndrome, which is impaired movement of the superior oblique tendon through the trochlea. Here, this is uh, the cause. Acquired, it is due to um, uh, uh, pan sinusitis or scleritis or rheumatoid arthritis, which will result in inflammation of the tendon. Uh, of uh, the superior oblique muscle. Trauma to the trochlea or superior oblique tendon, which may be uh, due to uh, uh, retinal detachment surgery like scleral buckle and so on. I have here uh, types, I have mild one, I have moderate one and I have severe. In, in mild one, I, I don't see any hypotropia in the primary position and no down shoot in abduction. In cases of abduction, the patient is abducting this eye like that. Here, the eye will be in, in its location, okay? This is called mild. Also in the primary position, the eyes uh, are also for it. Look at this moderate one. In, in moderate one, the eye in the primary position is also for it, but look at this. In abduction, you do have down shooting. Look at this, you do have down shooting of, of this eye like that. And this eye will be hypotrophic. Uh, in severe cases, you have you do have both. You have hypotropium to the primary position. You have down shooting and abduction. Uh, this will be compensated by chin up elevation with the face turned away from the affected eye because here the problem is in the medial uh, elevation, not in the lateral elevation. Okay, look at this one. Here the primary position, the patient is normal. Uh, um, if the, this patient is looking to this direction, look at this one. Here, uh, uh, there is somehow, somehow limited uh, elevation or limited uh, um, uh, limited elevation in this position, uh, and here the elevation is full. So the elevation deficiency is limited to the adduction or the medial position. Unlike that of the congenital fibrosis of uh, extra uh, ocular muscles, and uh, uh, unlike that of also the uh, double elevator palsy or monocular elevation deficiency. In cases of monocular elevation deficiency, you have um, you have uh, uh, failure of elevation uh, throughout the horizontal plane. Treatment is done by, in cases of congenital, it will resolve spontaneously. In cases of Brown syndrome, it will resolve spontaneously. Significant primary position or, or uh, um, here, uh, uh, treatment, in, uh, indications for treatment include significant primary position hypotropia, which is cases of severe uh, Brown syndrome. And it is done by uh, releasing the tension, releasing uh, the restriction of the tendon by lengthening the superior oblique tendon. In acquired cases, they may benefit from corticosteroids injected near or around the trochlea. The last one here, which will be pattern strabismus. I do have here uh, A, A and B pattern being uh, the most common ones. But before this, let's look at the definition here. Pattern strabismus is a horizontal deviation in which there is difference in the magnitude of deviation between up gaze and down gaze. Look at this one here. This is the primary position, which is which may be intact. Look at this one here. It is the upward. Here in an upward position, you, you do have exodivision and look at this one in in, uh, in downward you do have what you do have isodivision like that this is called uh, look at this one this, this is called the pattern and the reverse is done uh, by or the reverses for the a pattern b pattern a pattern and a pattern are um, uh, found in in 15 to 25 percent of horizontal strabismus cases so they are accompanying cases of horizontal strabismus I do have less common ones like that of uh, uh, Y pattern and um, I have also uh, something like gamma pattern, something like X pattern and so on. Okay, um, look at this one, uh, which is uh, uh, the etiology. The etiology here is important. Uh, how can we understand this? It may be related to oblique muscle dysfunction. Uh, what do you mean by this oblique muscle dysfunction? I may have over elevation and abduction or 
uh, overaction of inferior oblique, uh, muscle inferior oblique overaction, okay, or it's it's new term, or it's prefer preferable term, which is over elevation in adduction. This is called inferior oblique overaction. What is the action of the inferior oblique muscle? I have the primary action, which is uh, which is uh, uh, extortion, because all inferiors are extorters. Uh, the second action, which is uh, uh, elevation, and the tertiary action, which is abduction. Remember this mnemonic, which is ob -ab. Uh, You You remember this one. I told this one in the first uh, session. Ob -ab. All obliques are abductors. So this muscle will, will result in what? This, uh, this muscle will result in uh, elevation and abduction. Look at this one here, this eye. Uh, when the eye is elevated, it is abducted. This is logic because this muscle, this inferior oblique overaction will result in elevation and abduction. This, this is the first one. Also, um, when you have this muscle, um, the extortion will result in what? The extortion will result in having this lateral part or, or sorry, this, this superior rectus will, will be shifted laterally like that. The superior rectus will be here like that, okay? And this inferior rectus will be here like that, okay? Look at this one. If you do contraction of this uh, superior rectus, this will result in, uh, uh, this will result in elevation in this direction, elevation and abduction, something like that. So this muscle result in torsion and this torsional movement will result in change in the axis or change in the direction of action of the rectus muscle. The rectus muscle will be directed more temporally like that. So this will result in elevation, but this elevation will be accompanied by some sort of abduction due to the change in the direction of axis of the superior rectus muscle. Okay, these are the causes uh, of uh, the pattern in relation to over elevation in uh, abduction or in relation to inferior uh, uh, fear of weak overaction. Look at the A pattern here, which is uh, uh, related to related to uh, over depression in adduction or uh, superior oblique over action. Okay, look at this muscle. Uh, the superior oblique will result in what? It will result in uh, intortion. This is number one. It will result in also depression and also it will result in abduction. Look at this one. This muscle will result in depression and abduction. Look at look at this one here. In 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 depression, the eye will be the eye will be abducted like that. Okay, this is uh, uh, the primary position. Look at this one. This is called a pattern. So uh, uh, this is logic and this is easy because of the tertiary action of the muscle. Another one which is related to torsion. Again, here the eye will be tor uh, 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 it, it will have in torsion and the torsion will result in what? It will shift the superior rectus muscle nasally like that, and the inferior rectus muscle will be shifted temporarily like that. This is called in torsion. Okay. Uh, so uh, this inferior rectus muscle will cause uh, abduction together with depression, and this superior rectus muscle will cause or will result in uh, adduction together with elevation. This will result in the A pattern. This will complete the A pattern. Okay, uh, that is the relation between the uh, uh, obliques or oblique muscle abnormalities and A and B pattern. This is the first theory. I, ha I do have another theory here. Look at this one, the first theory. It is due to the tertiary action of the muscle, which is abduction, and also the torsional action, the ocular torsion. This will result in A and B pattern. Uh, ocular torsion may be, uh, may be associated with over elevation in abduction or over depression in abduction, or associated with uh, uh, inferior oblique over action or superior oblique over action, or it may be primary. Just the eye is, is uh, torsioned. Okay, primary ocular torsion. Okay, so uh, I mentioned this before, which is extortion will displace the superior rectus muscle temporarily, uh, and it will uh, uh, displace the inferior rectus muscle nasally, and the reverse is uh, about extortion. I mentioned this before. So extortion will result in B pattern, and intortion will result in E pattern. So here uh, it may be uh, uh, related to. Uh, oblique overaction, or it may not be related to oblique overaction. The third theory, the third um, solid theory, which is about simulated 
to oblique muscle overaction. It is not uh, oblique overaction. It is like oblique overaction. And here, the orientation of the globe, the globe itself will be uh, uh, somehow oblique. And this obliquity uh, is evident when you see the palpebral fissure. You see the palpebral fissure, which is slanting or which is oblique. Look at the obliquity here in the inferior uh, uh, temporal part, inferior temporally or the temporal part is, is oblique uh, downward like that. The temporal part is oblique downward like that. This is actually, this is related by uh, displacement of uh, this globe to outward when uh, elevating. This is related to the pattern uh, deviation. So it is, uh, the obliquity is in the axis of the muscle itself. And this is evident when you see obliquity also in the palpebral fissure. So the palpebral fissure is oblique this uh, will uh, uh, indicate the etiology, which is obliquity or uh, abnormal poly, abnormal poly or orb orbital poly system abnormalities. Okay. Um, here also, we do have also uh, other theories like uh, in, in unequal innervation between the superior and the inferior part of uh, the horizontal muscles, and this is controversial. What are the differences between V and Y patterns? This is extremely not important, extremely not important. But here, remember that in Y pattern, remember one word. Here in, in Y pattern, you don't have uh, oblique over action. You don't have over action of um, uh, the inferior oblique muscle. This is the main difference. Surgical correction of uh, pattern uh, deviation. Here, if I do have over, elevation in adduction, for example, or over depression in adduction, for example, I should weaken these oblique muscles. So I, I may do weakening procedure of these oblique muscles and this will result in improving the pattern. Okay, if there is horizontal muscles, um, if there is ESO deviation in the primary position or exo deviation in the primary position, for example, uh, the horizontal muscles should be corrected. So this is uh, um, uh, the, the main treatment. If you don't have over elevation in adduction or, or over depression adduction, so if you have normal, if you have normal uh, function functioning uh, inferior oblique and normal function functioning superior oblique, so uh, you you must uh, have some transposition vertical transposition of uh, the horizontal muscles. So you should operate on the horizontal muscles by doing recession or resection and so on, but. When you do the recession or resection, you should uh, you should transpose uh, the vertical position of uh, the insertion of these muscles. And remember this mnemonic, which is male. Remember this one. The medial rectus is always transposed towards the apex. In the lateral rectus, look at this pattern, which is V1. Uh, apply this rule. Here, the medial rectus will be moved to the apex. Here, the apex of the V, v pattern is towards downward. So the medial rectus will be uh, transposed downward. Look at this one. The lateral will be transposed upward like that. It is towards the empty space. The reverse for A pattern, look at this one. Here in A pattern, uh, the medial rectus will be uh, displaced to the apex. So, so the medial rectus will be displaced upward. The lateral rectus will be displaced to the empty space. So the lateral rectus will be displaced downwards. Okay, this is extremely important. So if you have over elevation abduction, so you, you should just weaken this muscle. Actually weakening of the inferior oblique or weakening of the superior oblique will alleviate the condition. But if you don't have this one, if you don't have this one, you should, you should just do what? You should just do transposition, vertical transposition of the horizontal muscles. Look at this one. Uh, if, you, if you are working on one muscle, for example, the patient refuses to be operated in, in both eyes. If you, sorry, uh, in, in one eye, the patient is uh, refusing to be operated in both eyes. So you are working in the medial rectus and the ipsilateral lateral rectus. Here, this one will be elevated, for example, upward, and this one will be elevated downward. This will result in torsion, okay? This will result in torsion, and this torsion may be manifest. The, the patient will, will have a fight with you after the surgery if he has manifest torsional diplopia after uh, surgery. So this patient may have uh, a fight with you. So uh, you, uh, you should be cautious 
when you do this, when you do transposition of these uh, muscles mutually like that. So uh, you do here, this, this one will be upward, this one will be downward, this will result in torsion. Okay. Uh, actually, um, also some surgeons believe that the superior oblique weakening may affect the horizontal angle. If you have horizontal angle, for example, of 30, okay, this uh, 30 uh, for exo, for example, okay, so 30 uh, present that are for exo. Uh, if you do a superior oblique weakening, this may result in from 10 to 15 prism adapters towards convergence. So the angle will be just 15 prism adapters. So you should correct just 15 prism adapter. This is controversial, by the way. In the inferior oblique, you don't have to do anything because it doesn't affect the horizontal position. Look at this one in, in B pattern together with, uh, uh, which is mostly associated with infantile isotropia. Uh, because in cases of infantile isotropia, you, you have over elevation in abduction or you have inferior oblique over action. So you should weaken this muscle. Without over elevation abduction, you should do vertical transposition of the horizontal rectus muscles according to the law, which is mean, according to the mnemonic, which is mean. If there is association like DVD, you should treat DVD. Um, as we mentioned before, by anterior this, anteriorization or anterior transposition of the inferior oblique uh, muscle. For the A pattern, it is commonly associated with exotropia. A pattern is commonly associated with exotropia. So here, uh, if there is over depression in uh, adduction, you should weaken the superior oblique muscle. Uh, if there is no, you should do vertical transposition according to the mnemonic, which is male. Okay, this is uh, uh, the uh, mind map of uh, the treatment of cases of um, uh, pattern strabismus. This is the end of strabismus. We will solve um, uh, some MCQs before we finish. What is the most common childhood exotropia? It is intermittent exotropia. These MCQs about exotropia and exotropia and uh, the special syndromes and also the patterns. 26 year old emetropic. Uh, six month history of difficulty with reading. On alternate cover test, she is uh, orthotropic at distance and has exodivation of 15 present doctor at near. Here, the exodivation is evident at near. This is called convergence insufficiency. And this patient has convergence insufficiency. The best treatment option would be what in cases of uh, convergence insufficiency. Here, this one, it is orthoptic therapy with base up. A base, sorry, base out uh, prism. This is called exercising prism or pencil push ups. This will induce more conversions. This will increase the conversions. If this fails, we do relieving prism, which is base in prism, but we, we should start first with the, the exercising prism, which is true regarding consecutive exo division or consecutive exotropia. Uh, there is usually limited adduction, not usually. Okay, overcorrecting myopia can help symptoms. Yes, this one is true. Why this one is true? If I do overcorrection of myopia, if I do overcorrection of myopia, the patient will have to, to do accommodation order to see will. So this accommodation will be accompanied by convergence and this convergence will help the symptoms. Uh, this will decrease the diplopia. So this is a temporary uh, treatment. Usually occurs after uh, initial surgery for exotropia. No, after initial surgery of esotropia as overcorrection result. More common in myopes. Uh, no, this is this is consecutive exotropia, not uh, uh, common in myopes. Okay, so this is false. Um, Nine-year-old girl is actually the intermittent exotropia may be more, more common in myopes, but consecutive one, which is as a result of uh, surgery, this, this is false. This is out of focus. Nine-year-old girl is noted to have abnormally or abnormality of eye movement on a routine or optic school screening visit. She has diminished uh, abduction and markedly diminished abduction. This is uh, limited abduction and limited abduction. This is type three Duane retraction uh, syndrome. This is Duane retraction syndrome. Actually, she may be normal in the primary position, which is true of uh, DVD. Dampens when the eyes uh, is undercovered. No, it will increased. 
it is some sort of latent deviation. So it is it is increased. It is an example of a condition that disobeys hearing tone law. No, hearing law, uh, hearing law, hearing law of um, um, hearing law uh, of having simultaneous uh, stimulation to the yoke muscles. So uh, this one is false. The disobeyment of Sherrington law is by Duane retraction syndrome. It occurs in approximately 80% of infantile isotropia by three years. This is extremely true. Usually unilateral law is false. Which of the following con constitutes a violation of Sherrington law? I told you this is Duane retraction syndrome. I do have co-contraction of both medial and lateral recti muscles in attempted abduction of the involved body. All are true of uh, uh, convergence insufficiency, except uh, it presents in school age children rather than in uh, infants. School age uh, children, convergence insufficiency uh, rather than infants. Yes, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, true. Uh, pencil push-ups are recommended over glasses in cases of convergence insufficiency, yes. Um, reduced near point of accommodation. What about this one? Here the near point of convergence will be elongated or will be longer. Here, look at this patient. This patient is uh, used to read from or to reading from this distance. Here he will have diplopia, okay? He will have diplopia. So he will have to, um, to 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 get this one elongated and this is called this is not called the near point of accommodation this is called the near point of convergence and this near point will be elongated not reduced so so this is not uh, uh, true this is not accurate as well it can be a post viral phenomenon yes this may be true uh, actually convergence insufficiency don't forget about this it is it may be related to parkinson uh, syndrome <clears throat> also Convergence uh, insufficiency may uh, occur in, in uh, older ages. This is also uh, uh, important. A patient, a patient presence has the following primary position uh, exotropia, 15 present after, uh, down gaze and exotropia, uh, 5 present after up gaze, exotropia, 30 present after. In, sorry, in, in primary position, the exotropia is 15. In down gaze, it will be minimal. It will be uh, just five. In, uh, in up gaze, it will be 30, okay? So here, this is a typical of the V pattern. Here, there is a V pattern. There is significant elevation of each eye with adduction, significant elevation or over elevation and adduction. This indicates inferior oblique over action. So uh, here, what is the management? The management, before I read, uh, I should correct for the horizontal deviation. So I'll correct for the horizontal deviation, which is exodivision by doing lateral rectus recession. I may do bilateral lateral rectus recession. And also I'll do weakening uh, of the inferior oblique. So I'll, I'll have inferior oblique weakening. Um, uh, uh, do I have to do transposition of muscles? No, I don't have to do transposition of muscles because here it is uh, uh, outlined. Look at this table here, the last one. It is outlined. If there is, uh, uh, if there is over elevation abduction, I just do weakening of the inferior oblique uh, muscle. Okay, so I don't have to do a vertical. Uh, transposition of uh, uh, the muscles. So the, the false one will be upward transposition of the lateral rectus and down, downward transposition of the medial rectus. Especially uh, here, they are, uh, uh, they are true by the way, but uh, if there is no over elevation and abduction, the over elevation and abduction will be sufficient. Uh, sorry, the inferior oblique over action or inferior oblique weakening will be sufficient. Um, Five-year-old boy presents with an exudivation of 30 present after at distance and 10 at near, okay? A patch is performed, and after this, the patient is 30 present after and 15. So this is through divergence excess. The patient then undergoes a bilateral lateral rectus recession. One week later, he measures 15 present after con consecutive isotropia is observed at three weeks. So we, we are talking about uh, consecutive ESO, okay? 
uh, after three weeks, the child has still thirty present after ESO and symptomatic. This is the, uh, this this child is diplopic. What is the next most appropriate step? Uh, prescribe enough base out present to fully neutralize the isotropia. Uh, this will alleviate the the diplopia by the way, but this this is not the true answer. Prescribe amniotic? No. This, this will be extremely out of focus. This will induce accommodation, okay? Operate for 15 uh, uh, present diopter isotropia. This means that you, um, you, you should do the surgery and here after three weeks, no, this is uh, not the, 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 the treatment option. This is false. Prescribe enough base out present to alleviate the diplopia, but leave small residual isophoria. Yes, this will be the true one because the residual isophoria will induce what it will induce the, 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 diverg the divergence, the fusional divergence. It will uh, train the brain to do more and more fusional. It will train the muscles, the lateral rectus muscles. So uh, this will be the good answer. Uh, um, I'll uh, I'll alleviate I'll just alleviate the diplopia with the least base out prism. All of the following below are characteristics of left brown syndrome except live limited elevation left elevation in abduction. Yes, this is a characteristic. Down shoot of the left eye in abduction. This is in uh, moderate to severe forms. Normal left elevation in abduction. Yes, this is. True. Left superior oblique overaction? No. Here I don't have superior oblique overaction. I just have uh, restricted tendon of the superior oblique muscle. So the, the, the abnormality is in the tendon, not in the muscle. Abnormal head posture with chin lift and left head tilt? Yes, this may be true. Um, all are recognized associations with Duane's syndrome. Except keratoconus, it is not associated. So number one is false. Short neck with low hairline? Yes. A persistent hyaloid artery together with epivalvar dermoid. Um, and this, this may be in a, in a relation, uh, this may be related to coloboma, which is which result from um, uh, delayed closure of the embryonic fissure or the optic or the uh, choroidal fissure. Okay, anisocoria also may occur. So here, the, the, the false one is keratoconus. Forget about this. The false one is keratoconus. A child with congenital nystagmus has a null point uh, in the right gaze with severe left head tilt. Surgical intervention for patient, for this patient might include what? Here, the patient is looking to the right. Here, the patient is looking like this to the right because this is the null point. I'll do what? I'll transfer this uh, null point from this right gaze to the primary position. So I, I should move both eyes to this direction, to this left direction. I move these eyes to here, this one, and this area and this area, okay? So uh, what will we do? For the right eye, we will do, um, uh, we will do recession of the lateral rectus and resection of the medial rectus and the reverse for the left eye. Okay, right eye, I'll do, or sorry, st start with left, left eye, I'll do medial rectus resection and lateral rectus recession. Let's, let's write down this, let's write down this. Uh, here in this eye, I want to move this eye like this. So I'll do what I'll do, right lateral rectus recession with left, medial rectus resection, okay? And the reverse will be in the other eye. Look at this one. Look at this one, right and right, sorry. Right lateral rectus re recession and right medial rectus resection. Right medial rectus resection and uh, yes, this one, this, this one, number D, this one will be the true one. Right medial rectus resection uh, left lateral rectus recession and left medial rectus recession with left lateral rectus resection, okay? This one will be the true uh, answer, number D. Which is not uh, an uh, indication for strabismus surgery in intermittent distance exotropia or intermittent uh, exotropia? Indication for surgery, abnormal head posture. This indication, this is indication. Increased frequency of breakdown of diplopia. Yes, this is... Uh, a sign of decompensation. Decreased stereopsis, yes, yeah, this is also indication. And increasing angle 
on prism cover test? No, this is not a condition because here, this angle which is increased may be uh, eliminated by the brain. So it, if, if there is good control, there is no need for surgery, uh, even if the angle is large. A patient with constant exotropy has the deviation of uh, 35 prism doctors at distance and 15 at near. After wearing patch uh, for one hour, the deviation Deviations are remeasured and found to be 35 prism doctors at distance and 30 at near. So this is called false divergence excess or simulated. Yes, simulated divergence excess or false divergence excess or pseudo divergence excess. Five-year-old boy presents with an exo deviation of 30 prism doctor at distance and 10 at near. On alternate uh, cover testing, Okay, the uh, a patch test is performed on this patient and now he measures 30 and 15. So here it is true divergence axis. What is the, the next most appropriate step? It is to remeasure uh, with or without here this one. It is uh, the, the plus three uh, add in order to uh, indicate whether there is high AC per air ratio or not. So you should look for the reason behind this true divergence axis because it is not usual to have through the version sixes. Eight-year-old girl is found on a routine optician assessment to have restriction of eye movement. Uh, specifically, there is limited elevation in abduction of the right eye. Without reading, it is right uh, brown syndrome. Right brown syndrome. I actually, I recommend that you read all the questions, but you know, I, I'm in the, in the, uh, at the end of the session and actually I'm, uh, I'm tired right now, but uh, here the answer will be right uh, uh, brown syndrome. But I recommend in the exam that you read all the questions because it may be tricky. On alternate cover testing of a patient with the left eye covered, the right eye fixes on a distance target. Look at this one, the right eye fixes on a distance target and the cover is shifted to the right. Uh, and here, um, um, the left eye moves down to pick up fixation. As the cover shifted back over the left eye, the right uh, eye doesn't move in order to reassume fixation. This is typical in, in what? This is typical in, in cases of dissociated vertical division or dissociated strabismus complex. This is extremely typical that uh, uh, this is this obeyment of the hearing glow. Okay, one eye is, is fixating here and the eye uh, under the cover is, is above like that, above and extorted and uh, abducted, something like that, okay? If you do uh, remove uh, the cover, this may be the same like that, it won't regain fixation. This is called DVD or dissociated vertical division. Both eyes won't move with each other, they won't move with each other. This is uh, this obeyment of hearing glow. The gentleman with Brown syndrome, which is the, the, uh, the uh, which is which of the following uh, in the past medical history is least likely to be implicated as having a role in causing the etiology of um, acquired one congenital sex nerve palsy. This has no relation. This is from the start. Scleral buckle. I told you that it is related. Marfan syndrome, acromegaly, and rheumatoid arthritis. They are they may be all related to Brown syndrome, and congenital sex nerve palsy is extremely out of focus. Which is least likely to be considered in the differential diagnosis of early onset or infantile isotropia? Bilateral sex nerve palsy, it is of the differential diagnosis. Of course, Mobius also because it is bilateral sex nerve palsy, they are the same. The Wayne type one, sorry, the Wayne type two, the Wayne type one is, is considered, but the Wayne type two, which is limited adduction, this is exo deviation, it is not exo deviation. So this one is false. Nystagmus blockage syndrome, which is nystagmus together with uh, esotropia. This is, of course, also strabismus fixus, which may be uh, uh, fixating in convergence. This may be also of the differential diagnosis because, of, uh, because also the angle is uh, large in cases of strabismus fixus. So here, uh, the, the false one will be doing type 2. This is the end of um, uh, the strabismus revision. I hope I tried uh, as possible as I can uh, to be uh, very brief and very informative. So uh, thank you. And I'll complete the next session, which is uh, glaucoma revision uh, uh, in the next. The next one will be revision of glaucoma. Thank you all.